as the world fights the coronavirus, a vaccine would be the more definitive and effective weapon. The WHO says that as of the 11th of April, over 70 vaccine candidates are in various stages of trials or developments. Human trials of two vaccine candidates have started in the US and China over the past few weeks. While doctors in Australia are studying the potential benefits of an existing 100-year-old vaccine against COVID-19. Now, the US FDA has approved a human trial application from Inovio Pharmaceuticals for its DNA vaccine, which has shown promising results in preclinical studies involving animals. This vaccine research is one of the many being funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, the latest is a vaccine candidate by Oxford University, which has been pushed into human testing phase. The vaccine candidate is, has been developed with support uh, of about 20 million pounds in funding from the UK government and will be tested on over 500 volunteers. The focus of this round of testing, the first of many phases, will focus on safety and tolerability. It will also provide an initial assessment of how effective the shot is. India's Serum Institute, which has partnered with various research labs to develop a vaccine against COVID-19, will also begin manufacturing this vaccine in anticipation of clinical trials succeeding by September or October. Now, if the trials are successful, Serum Institute will be able to make the product available within two to three weeks. And to speak more about the various anti-COVID-19 projects that Serum Institute is involved in and where things stand, I have with me Adar Punawala, the CEO of Serum Institute. Adar, many thanks for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. As I pointed out, 70 candidates across the world at this point in time in various stages of trials and development. But let's talk about what's happening at Oxford University. Now, Adrian Hill, director of the Jenner Universe, uh, Institute at Oxford University has said that they aim to have millions of doses by September once we have the results out of our trials. Now, everyone that we've spoken to has basically said that the minimum lead time for a vaccine to be out in the market will be between 12 to 18 months. How can we expect this to be out in September? Well, uh, Shireen, that's exactly right. Uh, typically, vaccines, as you know, takes a uh, long time, uh, many, many years, in fact. But with the regulatory approvals in India that have been very um, carefully uh, changed for this uh, uh, product development, uh, we're very pleased to announce. And that's why I made that earlier statement that we'll be able to do it by the end of this year. But there's a very strong caveat here. And I must clarify this because a lot of people think that they're going to get the vaccine in a few months. If the vaccine works mm. in the UK trial and we do another trial in India, which we're hoping to start shortly, in safety and efficacy, only then will it be available by October or November. And that's only if we start producing at our personal cost and risk by the end of this month. So we hope to build up uh, 20, 30, 40 million doses by September, October, in the hope that if the trial works, then we'll have this product. Otherwise, one would traditionally wait for the trial to get over and then start manufacturing and then have to wait another six months. So that's what I wanted to clarify. Because we're manufacturing uh, in, by the end of this month and early in May um, and starting to produce about four to five million doses is what we're trying to target on a monthly basis, hmm. we should have mm -hmm. a decent amount um, by September, October. Okay, so in a sense, there's a short-circuiting of the regulatory approval route, and you are going to be producing this at risk. So let me understand both those issues. Uh, and let's start with the regulatory approval process, because as of Thursday, uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, the first two patients who are part of the clinical trial have actually been injected with the vaccine. Now, there's about 500 people who are part of the clinical trial. So explain to me what happens on the clinical trial that's currently underway in the UK before I come to what you're doing on the production side. Okay. So I think uh, Dr. Adrian Hill who's, and uh, Sarah uh, Gilbert, who are uh, running this whole study, they need to establish and prove that there are enough cases in the vaccinated uh, cohort and group um, that got COVID and were protected and didn't get COVID because they were vaccinated and the vaccine worked and proved mm. itself compared to the group that has not um, uh, uh, been vaccinated, and you know you would see more cases uh, develop in uh, as in the disease um, sense uh, with that group. Now, once that's proven, that is the only time when we can start looking at a licensure trial in India, which we're trying to start in parallel also now in the next few weeks. So we'll both have a licensure tr uh, trial to prove exactly the same thing what they're doing in the UK in India as well. 
And mm. then you have a product that you can say is safe and efficacious for the market. And then the drug controller can say that, look, this can be given to the public at large. Okay, so now when you talk about, uh, you know, the licensure trial happening here simultaneously in India, do you already have the regulatory approvals in place? Will you now be applying for uh, getting the regulatory approvals? What is required to get the trial underway in India? So we've been in touch with DBT and uh, in fact, today I had a nice conversation with ICMR and uh, we'll probably be partnering with them to do it. And they've been very proactive and very helpful. And uh, I must say that the regulatory um, uh, uh, bodies, uh, all these departments, the health ministry, everyone has been very helpful. And uh, uh, so we hope to get that approval in the next one or two weeks. And then as soon as we can get the product down from the UK, which we're working on right now, in two, three weeks, uh, we should be able to start uh, this study in India as well. Okay, so starting this, uh, the clinical trials in India in two or three weeks, that is your best case scenario that you're working with at this point in time. Let's now talk about the production aspect. And you are uh, doing this at your own risk. So, uh, again, for the benefit of all of our viewers who are watching this, you are not going to wait uh, for the trial process to complete before you actually start production, correct? Correct, because, you know, we're not a listed uh, company and we're not accountable for our actions to investors in terms of pure profits and returns. So I was able to make this decision and um, uh, take this risk on, um, you know, uh, at the cost of other vaccines that we're putting aside temporarily so that we can build up the scale here. And the manufacturing plant here will have an investment of five to 600 crores that we've already done for one of the vaccines. And until we build a new, brand new facility for COVID-19, um, which will take two years, uh, I have decided to dedicate one of my existing facilities for this uh, so that uh, in the interest of uh, public health and uh, so that we can rapidly scale up the production in this manner. Uh, okay, I, I just want to get a little more detail from you on this. So you're saying that you're going to use an existing serum facility uh, to be able to produce this vaccine. You're not going to start till the trial is over. You will start the production anyway, uh, which is why it's production at risk. Now, will you require additional capital uh, and will you be funding it or do you hope to reach out to the government here in India or other organizations like the Gates Foundation, for instance, uh, to look for funding? Because in the UK, uh, you know, the trial uh, to a large extent is being funded by the UK government, that $20 million funding that's come in. Uh, according to Adrian Hill, it's going to go largely towards getting the trial underway. No, absolutely right, Shireen. Um, right now, so that uh, we don't lose any time, I'm privately funding it with our own reserves. But I will look at uh, government support. And yes, working with the Gates Foundation would be great because we've had many success stories with them. And so it'll probably be a combination, hopefully, um, uh, with them. And we're in very early talks. And I'm sure uh, some part funding or at least half of the manufacturing plant and purchase of the vaccine can be taken care of by the government because, you know, in the H1N1 story, we made a facility and then there was no one to buy the vaccine. And now the government understands that and uh, will definitely hope to stockpile some products and place some advance orders. And that's what I'm trying to explain. And uh, the responses have been very positive and hopefully that will, that will come together soon. But I wasn't wanting to wait till that happens. I, I didn't want to lose any time. You know, we're all in a race to get this as soon as possible because all our economies depend on getting a vaccine or a cure out as soon as possible. So I did, I, I've started funding it privately and we hope that we'll get the government support uh, very shortly, I hope. You know, uh, in a sense, you've sort of, as I said, short-circuited uh, the regulatory process. You're going straight from the trial, which is currently underway, to being able to produce the vaccine. But I ask you again to explain to us, how can you get this into uh, the production cycle as quickly as the end of the month, which is what you're hoping to do? What makes the vaccine, as it's currently being developed, so easy for you to be able to manufacture? Because that doesn't seem to be the case when we speak to others. Well, uh, this is the chimp adenovirus, which uh, we're talking about replicating. We have vessels in our R&D and other production facilities that are... Uh, pretty much, you know, 
uh, tailor made to handle this kind of technology and growing these kind of cells and virus. And um, that's why we're quite confident on doing it. And we'll probably start making two or three million doses per month, going up to five, 10 million doses as we go toward, I would say, July, August. And uh, that's why uh, this is not, you know, again, if this was a DNA vaccine or something else, I would say absolutely not, because there's, there's no facility today that we have that's designed for that. But this is very similar to some of the other products that we've got in the pipeline. We're fortunate enough to have that, uh, you know, already built. Otherwise, we would have we had to wait two or three years at least uh, to manufacture uh, okay. it in a custom design facility. Okay, so again, uh, because this is complicated stuff, so I'm asking you to break this down for us. You said that this is the chimp adenovirus, and you have the capability currently at Serum to be able to work on, on that virus, and hence there is a platform that's already ready to be able to manufacture and produce. Correct. That's correct. Okay, uh, so other, uh, you know, how confident do you feel? Because the trial is still underway. We don't know the efficacy of this. We've had bad news coming in from Gilead with uh, what's happened with uh, Remedisva. Uh, Sarah Gilbert and Adrian Hill uh, of Oxford University of the Jenna Institute feel very confident. In fact, I think they quantified it saying it feel 80% confident of, uh, of a successful trial. Uh, what are you basing your confidence on? I think their past track record, I think they had a successful Ebola vaccine. And, you know, they are very capable and very smart scientists over there who've been doing this for many, many years. Of course, look, I can only comment on my confidence and ability to manufacture because that's my strength. Um, it would be unfair for me to comment on what success rate they would really have um, on this. But I would say definitely uh, more than a 60% chance of success, uh, if not more. Uh, I can't comment at this, at this stage because, you know, they're the ones developing it. You'll have to ask them that question. Yes, uh, we will have to ask them that question. But finally, before I let you go, uh, you know, uh, assuming that everything goes as per plan, you hope to start production yeah. by the end of May? Yes, um, uh, absolutely. By the end of, way, uh, end of May, we should start producing about two to three million doses and then build from there. All right, Adar Punawala, we look forward to hearing more from you. And uh, we do hope that, uh, that you meet with the success that you're hoping for. I think this is going to be the shot that the world requires at this point in time. Thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Adar Punawala, they're explaining to us what they're hoping to do with Oxford University and the Jenner Institute. Uh, already the human trial has started in UK. Others saying that they're hoping to get that started here in India simultaneously and go into production at risk, going to production at risk because they're not waiting for the results of the trial before they start production. Uh, end of uh, May is when Serum hopes to put one of its existing facilities in use. We'll head into a break. We're up next. A slew of public interest litigations filed at the Bombay High Court alleges that non-COVID patients are being refused treatment at several hospitals. The High Court has asked the Centre and the Maharashtra government to, dis to respond more when we get back. The world, India included, is throwing every available resource at the COVID-19 pandemic. Hospitals have reorganized themselves to be ready to provide both testing facilities and care for patients. Hotels have been co-opted and transformed into isolation and treatment wards, and every available healthcare worker has been pushed to the front lines of this battle. But this global preoccupation with COVID-19 pandemic has pushed the treatment and management of other ailments to the back burner. That is the allegation made in three separate public interest litigations filed in the Bombay High Court. In response, the High Court has issued a notice to the central government and the Maharashtra government which alleges that hospitals were turning away patients who did not present themselves with COVID-19 symptoms, even if the patient presented with an emergency. The court will now hear the case on the 30th of April and both the centre and the state government will have to file their replies before that day. The court has asked that these affidavits also outline an effective solution to the problem. Joining me now to discuss this and the problems outlined in the PILs are is Dr. B.S. Ajay Kumar, the chairman and CEO of Healthcare Global Enterprises. Dr. Ajay Kumar, many thanks for joining us. Three PILs being filed in the Bombay High Court. And what we are hearing from many anecdotally, sir, is that whether it is dialysis or cancer care, elective surgeries, people are not being able to access uh, healthcare infrastructure at this point in time. This, how big a problem is it? Yeah, it is actually a very big problem. 
you use the right word access it's not only that the hospitals refusing but it also patients are not able to go there you know when there is no public transportation when there is no buses trains even taxis are difficult to get uber but it has made it very difficult for patients to access hospitals also now once they access the, the media the public the government also to some extent the fear is so much that you know people are made to believe every patient walking in is a covid patient it is not even before hmm. covid people had common flu cold and you know people came in a particularly in oncology people came with uh, infections bacterial infections yeah. and you know we managed yeah. but why are we having this uh, mega phobia where we think everybody is covid even our doctors are falling into this so they are taking hmm. we are taking a hmm. lot of preventive measures ppes everything but still you know the the number of cases as we know is not that high but because the worldwide phenomena the scare which gave as cause so much of scare among the hospitals and public and obviously whenever there is mm. one case some draconian measures have been taken to say we should shut down the whole hospital there is no need to yeah. shut the whole hospital yeah. so all these measures have really created fear and that is the reason for now doctor in the hospitals are fearing that will we be called a covid hospital will the future patients come mm. so a lot of it is preventive measures they are taking which is not needed you know we need to really for our oncology patients we need to we have encouraged them to come we have even gone on a public campaign to say please come if you have all okay. these symptoms and all they should come they should not fear patient mm. should not fear hospital should not fear taking care of them as long as we have patient safety and doctor safety and personal safety measures the key is to have safety measures mm. i think yes the key uh, is to have safety measures but you actually what yeah but dr kumar you Yeah, Dr. Kumar, you know, you spoke of the draconian measures for instance that if a uh, you know healthcare worker uh, is identified with covid uh, then the hospital is put under quarantine, the entire facility is off limits. Uh, now, do you believe that given the situation today with this fear that you speak of, the lack of access for patients who require medical attention and intervention, there needs to be a consistent uniform guideline especially when it comes to healthcare infrastructure uh, and opening it up uh, for non-covid patients absolutely and i think there are guidelines but are they being followed and you know for non covid patients if they should be particularly like diseases like cardiac disease cancer renal dialysis what you said coming for chemotherapy radiation there should be no issues they should come and take treatment they should you know go through the process of checking them making sure they know obviously they don't have any symptoms of covid which we have all done mm. but but it cannot be exaggerated to an extent where fear is created among the staff and doctors and the hospital and the patients the patients are not even coming you know if suppose somebody has a heart uh, chest pain what we have noticed is even a lump in the breast mm. patients are only calling through you know we have set up the video conferencing we have done all the uh, things to see if they can access us but beyond that to come they are hesitating and also you now the accessibility with transportation is a problem i think we have approached several governments including karnataka cm means they will arrange transportation and you know do a little bit better in conveying the measure to the public that is what we need to do even the media that please if you have other diseases do not hesitate to approach the hospitals they should and there is some hesitancy on the part they of should. patients also to approach yeah hmm Mm. Uh, you know since you spoke of this hesitancy of patients uh, to approach hospitals given the fear of being able to yeah. uh, of being infected if they were to visit a hospital etc now do you worry that especially when it comes to uh, cancer treatment and it comes to cancer related yeah. cases that we may in fact uh, uh, see a situation where people who have already been identified with uh, as cancer patients or who may uh, you know seek attention uh, and haven't been diagnosed yet we will see a spike yeah. in those number of yeah, cases because of the lack of attention my, yeah i have called it in my writings as collateral damage this is huge the collateral mm. damage for other diseases is going to be huge if we do not take uh, you know measures to correct this we need to take it immediately where you know government private hospitals healthcare workers media all have to convey to the patients in no uncertain terms that pay, people who have 
symptoms of these diseases should come to come forward and not fear the COVID. One of the things that is happening also is the patients are fearing, do I go to a hospital which is COVID hospital? How am I going to get COVID? You know, these are the, you know, unnecessary mm. fears. And honestly, patient to patient contamination has been very few. So it is all related mm. to the you know the community where people are living. Somebody went abroad, came through that. So patient to patient has been very yeah. few, but still people are not looking at the data. You know the most important thing is we have to mm. look at the data and then and then give that assurance. I heard yes. somebody making a statement on TV yesterday. All patients who come to you should be considered COVID. How can you make a statement like that in public, yeah. which causes yeah. more fear? So yeah. we have to we have to be very careful in how we make statements and we have to address the issues of non-COVID patients in a way where they feel mm. comfortable to come to the hospital and even the doctors and healthcare workers should feel secure. That is what we have done and I think it is. we should definitely address this issue. Absolutely. And I think you make a very valid point. Let's look at the data and let's look at what the data is telling us before, uh, you know, we, we sort of drive into hyperbole. But uh, before I let you go, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, you spoke of the collateral damage uh, uh, and what is uh, what this pandemic is actually doing to non-COVID patients. Now, what are the measures that you believe need to be taken by the health authorities, both at the center as well as uh, the state to ensure that uh, that we end this? So the one important measure is put down a certain uh, SOPs which, so that the hospitals need not close. If there is a COVID patient or a staff, the person, the place can be isolated, measures can be taken. So, you know, the other patients are not threatened in any way. There's no fear. That SOPs, and we also have to publish that so the patients who come in know how this particular hospital has taken these measures to protect their interests. First point is patient safety and interest of non-COVID patients. That has to be highly publicized. I, and then, of course, the providing transportation, logistics is one other important thing. But first and foremost is to give that comfort. And the government has to take active role in this, whether it is local, you know, the corporation locally, state government, central government, all have to come together to protect the interests of the non-COVID patients. And otherwise, you know, we are seeing some anecdotal cases where patients have had heart attack, they are unable to come to the hospital. Recently, I mm. had one of the hospitals mm. in Bangalore told me four people who literally died on their way. I mean, they couldn't make it. The dead bodies came into the hospital afterwards. They could have been saved. So there are various instances mm. like this which are really coming up now. I, I'm, I'm telling you one thing, post-COVID, we will see a lot of such stories coming out. You know, we have to take a lot of measures now to address this issue. Yes, measures have to be taken to address this issue and correct the collateral damage that you speak of. Uh, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, thanks very much for joining us and uh, giving us your perspective on what is a very important issue. Three PILs being filed in the Bombay High Court saying that non-COVID patients are not being able to access healthcare infrastructure. And Dr. Ajay Kumar saying that that is absolutely right and that there needs to be uh, an SOP, guidelines that are actually uh, actioned on the ground that enable... Uh, uh, you know, non-COVID patients to access healthcare for treatment from cancer to tuberculosis to dialysis uh, and more. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this special broadcast. From all of us here, many thanks for watching. Do stay tuned. The news will continue.